Now, the classical world, which uh, started around 500 BCE, um, saw the emergence of organized religion in several parts of the world, especially in the Middle East, the Indian subcontinent, and East Asia. But for millennia, people have been worshiping various deities, forming religious orders, and making sacrifices to gods in hopes of transforming their daily lives. So today we're going to talk about those earlier forms of religion, um, Neolithic religious devotion in particular, and we'll go all the way back to 9130 BCE. As you can see on the timeline here, this is when uh, one of the sites we'll be talking about, Gobekli Tepe, was built. Um, it was used all the way up to 7370 BCE. And we'll also be talking about a site called Chatel Hayuk, which was built around 7500 BCE and lasted until 3500 BCE. Um, I put Stonehenge on here because Stonehenge is normally thought of as a very, very early um, evidence of cultic religions, but um, the two that I'll be talking about today preceded Stonehenge by thousands of years, so that's kind of something that's interesting to think about. Now, Gobekli Tepe is an archaeological site in modern Turkey. You can see it here with the, um, it's marked with a red star. And it gives us some insight into the importance of spirituality to Neolithic humans. The site sits on the highest point of a long mountain range in eastern Turkey and dates from the earliest part of the Neolithic period. So this would have been right when humans were discovering agriculture, the very beginnings of civilization. Gobekli Tepe consists of T-shaped stone pillars that are up to 18 feet high and weighing several tons, and these are arranged in circles. There are four circles uh, made up of 10 to 12 pillars each, and in the middle of each circle um, stands more T-shaped pillars that are taller than all the ones that surround them. Um, the pillars were carved with elaborate scenes and connected by walls made of quarried stone. So this find is, is just astounding. The monuments at Gobekli Tepe were completed almost 7,000 years before Stonehenge. So if you think Stonehenge is impressive, then this is so much more so. Um, to most experts, these pillars and walls made a sacred space of some sort. These structures were purposely buried with garbage, dirt, and other debris shortly after they were built. Well, relatively shortly. Um, 100 years later, another layer of T-shaped pillars were erected, but these ones were smaller and connected rectangular rooms, which experts have also identified as religious spaces. Um, this site was abandoned entirely around 7300 BCE. The pillar carvings are pretty intricate. They include foxes, serpents, boars, gazelles, asses, ducks, etc. And the depictions are extraordinarily accurate and match to the flora and the fauna that were discovered at the archaeological site. So we know that these people were um, carving the kinds of animals and plants that they were familiar with. We know that the T-shapes represent humans because they were given belts and loincloths where the waists would be if these were humans, but they don't have faces. So these figures stand out as very different from the human life figures made by other humans around Anatolia at this time. So archaeologists believe that they were meant to represent deities gathered together at Gobekli Tepe for some unknown reason. Uh, this is an artist's rendering of what Gobekli Tepe would have been like when people were there. Um, the most fascinating thing about Gobekli Tepe is that no, uh, not one domestic space um, has yet to be discovered. So as far as archaeologists can tell, no one ever lived there. 
And this is striking because it would have required massive manpower to build these structures in a time with such rudimentary technology. Um, the material had to be quarried, moved, crafted, and erected. And this would have required skill and technology that some experts have argued these early people didn't have. Um, we think that the site was a destination for religious pilgrimage for early nature, nature cults. Um, a place where, where people would gather, feast, celebrate their deities, and then disperse once the festivities were over. The implications of this find are staggering and raise more questions. So how were these various groups of people communicating with each other? How did they navigate to this sacred space and organize themselves to achieve, achieve this massive undertaking? Um, why did they build these massive monuments and then intentionally bury them? And where did they live, if not nearby? Four hundred and thirty miles from Gobekli Tepe lay another site named Chatel Hayuk. So, as you can see here, it's about um, an eight-hour drive. So it's all the way on the other side of Turkey, really. This is an artist's rendering of what Chatel Hayuk would have looked like. Um, so, Chatel Hayuk was an ancient town on the Konya Plain, which thrived between 7500 BCE and 3500 BCE. At its height, the town had a population of 10,000. So, for comparison, um, the first city in Uruk in Mesopotamia had a population of 50,000. But Uruk developed almost 4,000 years later. So, we're talking very, very early. Some scholars call Chatel Hayuk a city. Um, some some don't so we're we're just going to call it a town um and we think it may have been a regional trading center the residents of chatel hayuk specialized in obsidian tool making and other crafts which were exported to nearby towns the obsidian was collected from a local volcano and fashioned into arrowheads spearheads wedges blades and mirrors the process they used, called pressure flaking, required highly specialized skill. So they traded obsidian tools for goods they couldn't get locally, like wood, copper, shells, and asphalt. For example, residents of Chatel Hayuk imported flint from Syria and found it into daggers. Residents of Chatel Hayuk grew wheat and barley and gathered legumes, nuts, fruits, and berries. They domesticated cattle and used them for meat, milk, and transport. But they also hunted deer, boar, bear, and leopard for additional meat and skins. In addition to milk, they also drank and brewed beer. So these peoples were kind of in this, in this transitional phase between the hunter-gatherers and um, the agricultural humans. They were sort of um, just at that beginning phase of agriculture. The town's architecture is probably um, the most unique thing about it. Um, they lived in flat-roofed buildings that were cobbled together with back-to-back -back walls, and there were no doors whatsoever. Everyone entered their dwellings through rooftop openings, which they accessed with retractable ladders. Um, there were few small windows that were built high up on the walls, as you can see here, um, and the outer dwellings formed a solid wall around the town. So all of these features suggest that the town was built in a way that defended the residents from raiders. It's kind of interesting to think of what people would have done if someone was disabled or, or elderly, how they would have um, climbed these ladders to get into the homes from the roof. Archaeologists have discovered that one-third of all the dwellings that they discovered at Chatel Hayuk were sacred spaces. So rather than a centralized temple, Chatel Hayuk contained many dispersed shrines all over the town. And this is a um, replication of one of those shrines. 
Um, in a time when resources were finite and construction took considerable time and energy, the dedication of one third of all of the interior spaces to shrines is kind of intriguing. Um, the spiritual must have been extremely important to the residents of Chateauhuk for them to devote so many resources to worship. So this is something that's kind of interesting to think about. Um, before this, we, we didn't have much evidence of uh, Neolithic religious devotion and the, the form that it took. The town's earliest wall paintings contain devotional hunting scenes, and you could see one of those in the reconstruction of um, the temple on the previous slide. There was a, a hunting scene, I think, of a deer. Um, but uh, as civilization progressed, um, hunting scenes were replaced by fertile female figures. So the most famous of these female figures is called the Seated Woman of Chateauhayouk, um, and it's made of baked clay, and it depicts a heavy-breasted woman on a seat with feline-headed armrests. So she is actually in the process of giving birth as she st sits on her stately throne. So you can sort of see her 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 child coming out um, between her legs. Um, she is what's known as a steatopagus figure, which means that she has wide hips and heavy thighs. Um, female figures with this body type are very common in Neolithic era sculptures and paintings, and they're usually associated with fertility and the idea of being well nourished. This, along with the image of the seated woman, suggests that fertility and the womanly process of birth was sacred to people at Chateauhayouk. Interestingly, Chateauhayouk has no monumental artwork or violent rituals like in some other Neolithic set settlements. Um, generally speaking, male-driven cultures contain phallic monuments, like think of uh, the obelisk, the obelisk in Egypt, uh, for example. Um, like the seated woman, um, their objects of worship were decidedly female in Chateauhayouk with voluptuous breasts and large bellies. And this, along with the absence of all the markers of male-dominated society, has suggested to anthropologists that Chateauhayouk society was matrilineal and that its most important element, religious culture, was produced predominantly by women. So I have a fun fact. Um, I know I said that Chateauhayouk, um, the people living at Chateauhayouk, they nobody found any uh, evidence of violent rituals. But for a long time, um, Chateauhayouk's first archaeologist, James Mellart, argued that the residents of Chateauhayouk practiced excarnation. So excarnation uh, refers to um, a practice where people would abandon a corpse outside of a city um, or outside of their town or city walls, whatever, um, so that vultures would consume its flesh. And then they'd go back out and collect the bones and bury them within the city walls. Um, but so, so James Mullart argued um, because of what he saw with um, the buried humans that he found at Chateauhayouk that they practiced this kind of gruesome practice of excarnation. Um, but his students, um, he has long since passed away, but his students have actually just proven his hypothesis um, for, in various technical ways. Um, and more recent archaeologists working on the site have shown that Chateauhayouk was an unusually peaceful society. So Chateauhayouk and Gobekli Tepe both remind us to not underestimate Neolithic societies. They were sophisticated and technologically advanced, maybe more so than we have realized. Um, Gobekli Tepe and all that we've learned from it suggest that our perception that Neolithic people weren't sophisticated came from a lack of evidence and not from the realities of their lives. Chateauhayouk tells us that as uh, humans began building urban societies, the sacred remains uh, an important part of their built environments. So um, keep these things in mind as we discuss future cultures.